just before we started, I just want to just give a brief history of, of Elastic. Uh, and like with every story, it starts with once upon a time. But uh, everything actually started with the Lucene engine, which is an uh, open source search engine written complete in Java. And that was started in 1999. Uh, and it was a great search engine for full text search. Uh, and it could handle you know, the amount of documents that we were searching by then, which was maybe a few thousands. Uh, but it was not really good for scaling. I mean, you could pump up the, the server and so on, but you Hit a, hit a limit uh, when it came. And it was not really easy to work with either. It's, uh, you had to have Java clients uh, to connect to it, uh, and it was actually hard work for developers to integrate to it. So uh, there was a guy call, called Shay Bannon, uh, the, the founder of Elastic. Uh, he started to look into this, and he developed something first called Compass, but it's later renamed, but he started to build a new search engine on top of Lucene uh, with two things uh, at the mind. And one, it should, it should be distributed from the ground up, so it, it scales very well, and it should be easy for developers to work with. And this, the, uh, the Elasticsearch was founded in, uh, in 2010, or 2012 was, was the company uh, founded. And today it's uh, one of the most successful open source projects in the world, and we can see that also from, from the success with, with Elastic. Um, and yeah, I should also describe a bit what the Elastic stands for. So I don't know, you maybe heard about ELK, uh, the E-L-K, and that stands for Elasticsearch logs as in Kibana. But as you can see over the years, we have uh, got more components to it, like beats. Uh, so now we refer to the Elastic Stack. Um, and Elasticsearch is, let's say, the heart of the, the Elk Stack, the Elastic Stack. Uh, and that's where you index and make your, your, your data searchable. And to get the data into Elasticsearch, you have two components to your help. You have one of the beats, which is a lightweight shipper, like an agent that you install on the servers, on the, on the containers to ship lightweight data back to, uh, to Elasticsearch. And you also have Logstash, which is uh, more like a foolproof uh, ELT or um, parsing tool and, and filter tool that can filter data and send back to Elasticsearch. Uh, and on top of it, you have the user interface, which is a uh, user interface where any actually non-technical person can make uh, queries and do visualizations of the data. Uh, and then you also have something called XPAC. So everything here is, let's say, open source. So you can you can download it, then you can innovate it, you can develop on top of it. Uh, and then you have XPAC, which is uh, the say, a commercial plugin that we at Elastic uh, can provide through uh, through subscriptions. And here you have some features that we see that a uh, lot of our customers is using for when they go into production. So. You have things, things like security, which is uh, gives you role-based access to the data in here, which could be, for instance, very useful in, in uh, now when, when it's about time for GDPR or this kind of personal data protection schemes comes into place. Uh, but it also have uh, things like uh, encryption and so on. Uh, you have alerting, which is... Uh, uh, alerting and notification engine, so you can set different thresholds uh, on different metrics, and you can get alerts sent to your. It could be email or a dashboard or Slack um, or PagerDuty or any actually webhook that we can integrate to, so you can get the alerts. Uh, machine learning uh, is an uh, unsupervised uh, anom anomaly detection, so it. I can find anomalies in, uh, among your data and thereby spark, uh, uh, for instance, an, uh, an alert to you that something is happening. And monitoring is uh, for monitoring the Elastic cl cluster itself, so it can be useful when you go into production. Reporting is, yeah, you can get your dashboard into reports. And graph, which is a relation-based uh, visualization of, uh, of uh, yeah, relations of the data, which could be useful, for instance, in security operations and so on. 
And this could be based on both, of course, bare bone or, or, uh, or VMs, or you can let Elastic to host it for you in something called Elastic Cloud. Or we also have a tool that you can manage your own cloud instance in your private cloud using something called Elastic Cloud Enterprise. Uh, but I'm here to talk about performance uh, and best practices. So, uh, but before we go into that, I also want to uh, explain a bit what the, what the Elasticsearch is. So, <coughs> Elasticsearch has uh, is based on a cluster, and the cluster has one or many different so-called nodes, like basically servers, and every node can have one or many many roles and one of the roles is master roles and master roles take care of the kind of cluster wide actions like create a new index or delete an index or decide where on which nodes should the data rely on so it's kind of the brain brain in the cluster uh, and then you have something called data nodes and that's where you yeah store all the data so that's also where you do, say, the scaling. So if you need more space to save more data, you add more data nodes. Or if you need more computer power for your queries or aggregations or whatever it might be, you add more data nodes. So that's how Elasticsearch scales. <coughs> and just to uh, explain, so you can actually start with a uh, first time I come in contact with, with Elastic. I actually started to do, yeah, install Elasticsearch on my on my Mac, so it's very easy to get started. So you can have actually one node running on this, which has all the roles, meaning it's it's a, both a data node and a master node. Uh, and you can also install Kibana on it, so you can do play around to do visualizations. So this is just for you know this example here with one master node and one data node and one Kibana node is for you know to try it out and basically kick the tires. So this is nothing that we recommend this setup to do in production, but it's it's a good way to get started and do prototyping, for instance. Um, but if you want to go into uh, production, you need probably some kind of high availability. And what we are what what we are recommending is uh, having at least three master nodes. And the reason for that is something we call split brains. So it's an awful expression actually, but it's if as we are so as we are a distributed search engine, we are so dependent on the, the networking in between. So if there for some reason someone slips over uh, uh, <coughs> a cable or something, there's some disconnection between one of the most nodes and the other most nodes, we must be able to the remaining most nodes must be able to reach what we say quorum to select the new say master that decides this. So, yeah, that I should say here as well that this is we call this master nodes. That's a bit sloppy actually because we should actually say master eligible nodes. So only one is master all the time, and the master choose in between which which uh, which one should be the master. Uh, so yeah, so this is you know. Uh, Say a minimal setup for for production, and then of course many of our customers wants to add, say on top of the uh, on the open source, the commercial plugins which is XPack which adds instances like security so you can do encryption uh, of all the the data flows, as well as you can do certain alerting and so on. And then you can start shipping, say, data into uh, or events into Elasticsearch. And that is using something called beats, again. So you have different type of beats here. You have file beats, which basically ships files as such. You have metric beats that take metrics from the, the environment and the machine, for instance, like CPU load or, or, um, or storage quotas, etc. And you have packet beat if you want to get uh, NetFlow data, what's happening from a networking point of view. Uh, so this is a very lightweight pipeline to ingest in that sense. And then you can add more, so you can put something uh, in between here. So you can sh let the beats 
feed into something called Logstash, which then can make more enrichment of this uh, events you're sending in. So Logstash has multiple uh, plugins like uh, Geo, uh, Geo enrichment, so it can take IP addresses and and enrich the the events with, for instance, country and city and this kind of geospatial information on top of it. Here's also where you can clean the data, take out data that you don't want for some reason into Elasticsearch um, or do some processing on it. And then Logstash pushes this into Elasticsearch. And Logstash also scales, so that's, that's, it's not a cluster based, but that you scale it with the number of more instances as you, as you need. The more, the more parsing and filtering you do, the more, more power you need. Uh, and we can get back to that a bit later as well, how we scale that one. And then if you have more scale, and this is especially if you have a very peaky behavior here on, on the ingest side, uh, you, have, you have persistent queuing here. So if, for instance, Elasticsearch cannot swallow the, the load from Logstash, you have persistent queuing here. But also if you have a lot of noisy here or a lot of peaks happening on the ingest side, you might also want to put in a messaging queue uh, between uh, the agents and Logstash in order to, yeah, if you have a, a, an avalanche of events coming for some reason, you can have a, have a persistent queue there that, uh, so when, when the peak goes down again, Logstash can take it one by one from the queue and ingest into Elasticsearch. And this is again for for you not to, to lose any events uh, that's coming in. And yes, so in 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 certain low cases you can have quite quite a lot of events coming in, as I said. So <coughs> you can also define different uh, type of uh, hardware. Uh, say attributes into your data node. So <coughs> if you want to, yeah, so the data nodes do two types of work. So one is of course that you, it takes capacity when you index the events and when you query the events. And these two things happens on say new data coming in. So you can <coughs> assign like a, like what you call hot nodes that are basically SSD based uh, servers for new data coming in and this is probably also the data that you are more interested to query so it's more a query intensive uh, type of data that relies on the the hot hot nodes and then as the data ages they get of course not so much updated and then also probably less queried so then you can move those indexes into warm nodes and eventually also into to cold nodes if you like that but this is um, a typical example that we see with, with some of our high intense logging customers uh, with Elasticsearch. Hey, you also have something called cross cluster search, and um, that is when you have yeah several clusters of Elasticsearch and you want to maybe query them at, at one location. Um, so maybe you heard something about before it was we had something called the tribe node that didn't scale that very well. So now in six six at all, or I think it was section for five dot six somewhere, we actually introduced something called cross cluster search node, which is a which could be a dedicated cluster just doing searches across different clusters. Uh, so we have some customers using this. Uh, so this could be a way to to uh, if you have separated uh, clusters and you want to do a search across. And, <coughs> and another uh, typical architecture uh, is if you want to have uh, like geographical redundancy uh, between two different pipes. So <coughs> we are still there to, to go, but um, in this case, you have two data centers and you want to have an active active setup between uh, the two different uh, uh, elastic uh, stack pipelines. 
And here again, you're using some, we call the logstash sandwich, which is uh, a logstash pushing into a messaging queue and into, for instance, Kafka to a uh, topic at Kafka. And then you have two other log stashes, each in every data center that subscribes to, uh, to, to the topics. And thereby you also get a replication across the, the two different data centers. And uh, the data gets replicated, so you have the same uh, data in, in both of the data centers in the Elastic Search clusters. Um, and the reason why you have to have um, a log stash here is also that, that Elastic cannot pull any data, so it's you need a log stash that pulls the data from, from the Kafka queue and pushes it into Elasticsearch. Um, yeah, I was also about to, to uh, talk a bit about the new stuff, what's with, with coming in the latest releases. So now we are on uh, 6.1.2, I think, uh, out there. And we are about to release 6.2 in, in, in this week or next week, I think. Uh, but I just to give you some, some highlights of uh, new features that I think would be could be useful uh, in the 6.0 and 6.1 release uh, for Elastic and Logstash and Beats. Uh, upgrading Elasticsearch has uh, has usually historically meant um, basically a full cluster restart and and downtown downtime. But uh, from 6.0, 6.0, there is no more downtime. So with the uh, with Elastic uh, 6.0, you get something called uh, the the upgrade assistant. So it helps you to do a cluster uh, checkup. So basically, you upgrade your cluster up to the latest 5.x release, which is 5.6. And you run this cluster checkup in Kibana that checks if you have any deprecated settings or any deprecated or bad mappings in your data and gives you warnings so you can make your 5.6 cluster ready for upgrade to, to 6.0 or 6.x. Um, and you also have a re-index helper. So if you have old indexes from 2.x, uh, it also helps you to re-ingest those uh, to the 5.6 version, so it can actually be carried over to the 6.x. And you also get logging from different deprecations uh, that you also get warning about. Uh, so if you are on, for some, uh, maybe I can check which, uh, I guess there are some Elasticsearch users here, right? So uh, which ones are using 2.x now? We have one there, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Phytotex. Yes, quite a few. And Sixtotex. Okay, yeah. It's, it's a mixed bag, but it's it's a, it's a lot of Sixtotex. That's more than I expect, actually. So that's that's good news. Uh, so yeah, for you that are on on Phytotex, uh, yeah, first you need to do a rolling upgrade. So you can do from 5.2, say up to 5.6 rolling upgrade, so you don't have any downtime there. And then you do a rolling upgrade from 5.6 to 6.x. And if you, for some reason, don't want to, if you have a lot of uh, data that you don't want to, or for some reason don't want to upgrade a certain cluster, we also now also support this cross-cluster search between major versions. So you can have cross-cluster search between, for instance, 6.x and a 5.x cluster. Uh, so that could also be good to know. So now I talked a bit about how to say do the upgrade, and maybe I should also talk a bit what or why you should upgrade. Uh, Elasticsearch is using something called doc values, which is the column columnar store for uh, for for data, and this works very well in in or had worked very well in dense data, meaning that Every every document or ev yeah every document has a has a key value filled in basically, 
But if you have, in this case, what we call sparse data, where you have a lot of gaps between the different uh, fields, you still have to pay storage for even if it's empty here. You basically, you have to fill in with a null value. And that's, of course, not very efficient. But now, thanks to, to features in Lucene 7, we have something called a new alternative encoding format for sparse, um, sparse data storage. And that, of course, saves a lot of disk storage space and, and also good for your fi file system cache uh, efficiency and such. So that's one good feature. Uh, another uh, feature is uh, sorted uh, queries or sort sorting at index time. So what this basically means is that um, yeah, you pay for the sorting when you do the ingestion of the data. And that's, that's uh, it's not good for every use case, but it's good for use cases where you know what kind of sorting you want to get out. So this is an example where you have uh, sorted the uh, on, on, yeah, on scoring for the different players. Uh, and that means that when you, for instance, want to query for the top three players, you don't have to go through all the players until you know that you have the res uh, received the, the top three players. You can, as you know, it's sorted. You can you can terminate the the query earlier, and um, and retrieve the the results quicker. So that's that's a that's a use case that that we've seen uh, asked for as well. <coughs> Another uh, feature is uh, with the um, with instant recovery for replicas. So with 6.0, we also introduced something called uh, a translog with uh, with uh, sequence numbers. So for every new data that we write, we we, we keep a trans transaction log. So if one of the shards gets disconnected, uh, it when it comes back online again, it can directly check. Oh. <laughs> it can directly check the transaction log and basically replay only those. Uh, those actions that happen since he lost the connection. So that means that the recovery for this shard is, is much faster because it doesn't have to say copy the whole chart. Um, and this also with, with the sequence uh, number and transaction log, it's also something that, that builds for the future because remember that when we had cross data replication in the previous slide, we had to use a Kafka queue here to replicate it. So the idea is also here that we build native support for uh, cross uh, cross data center replication with this uh, sequence number as well. So we can make sure that everyone has consistency over the different uh, data centers in the different clusters. But that comes uh, later in 6.x. Uh, another uh, enhancement is uh, about the watch execution, meaning alerts. So uh, until now, all the all the watches has been executed on the master nodes, uh, and as I said, you probably only have three master nodes uh, in production. So that yeah was a kind of limitation. So but now with the six of text feature, we actually have are able to run the the watch ex execution, the alerting engines. On, on the nodes which holds the the dot watches index, which could be yeah the, all the data nodes for instance. So now also the, the alerting scales with with your cluster as such. And alerting yeah this is also when I say it's it's not in 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 the open source version or open source but needs this XPAC uh, plugin. Another feature in Elasticsearch 6.x was uh, around enhancement around security. Uh, and now we, we mandate to, if you have security uh, plugin, you are mandated to use encryption between the nodes. And that is just only to one for, of course, to control which nodes are joining the cluster, so you know which certificate is using. And also, of course, to encrypt the, the communication between the nodes. And here as well, we we also uh, move away from this kind of default passwords we had with Elastic and, and Change Me password. So now you you are enforced to uh, yeah to use um, a strong password uh, 
uh, during the installation of Elastic. Because yeah, we saw in, in our cases that we had many <laughs> users that didn't change the change me password uh, to something stronger. So the way to go was to enforce strong passwords. Uh, so let's move on to the Kibana, to the UI of, uh, of Elastic. So the first thing you will realize, uh, and I guess if you upgrade to 6 x is that there's a new color scheme. Uh, before, like in 5.x, 5 we had uh, yeah, pink, uh, pink colors and kind of quite bright colors with white text, and that maybe looked nice and was cool, but it was not really good for accessibility. So that's something we wanted to... Uh, take up on with 6 attack so now we using high contrast color scheme uh, and you also have keyboard accessibility so you can actually navigate through the whole UI using your your keyboard only so that's another important things to uh, to take on so that's uh, yeah one of the most notable uh, features you see when you go into uh, Kibana 6 attack Another highly requested feature has been uh, export to, to CSV. So you have you are able to export from directly from the Discover tab in Kibana, uh, and here you can also schedule these exports on using the trigger or the alerting engine, basically. So you can ask for a CSV file to export it to your email, yeah, every day or every week or whatever you might want to have. So that's an, another very uh, sought after feature. Um, another thing is uh, lockdown edits with dashboard only mode. And that is, uh, I think everyone has that guy in the, the office that if you give him access, he will delete something or, or change something. Uh, so with the Kibana 6.0, we also have something called dashboard only. So that basically means that this has this role only has uh, has a read-only access, and you can only see the dashboard. So you can't do any changes. So that's um, another good thing. Um, and we also improved, so you can now go uh, full full uh, full screen mode and that's especially useful if you're using Kibana if you have some kind of knock screen and so on so you can yeah use your full uh, full screen size and, and see it from distance uh, yeah and you can of course get out from the full screen using just uh, the escape button or press the button oh, it's just another big picture on the same thing uh, with alerting, which is yeah defined in uh, in Kibana, you can now also add uh, your your email. So if your Elastic cluster is unhealthy or you get alerts, you can also get uh, not only a red light in in the dashboard, but also get an email saying that there's something you should look at. And you now also get uh, so a UI to uh, in Kibana to uh, create uh, new uh, threshold alerts. Uh, so it helps you with the suggestions and type forward type of behavior. So helps you to define which which uh, index it should look for uh, and how often you should run the query. And then you can quite easily add the the, the condition of what what should it look after for. And you directly get like a preview of your historical data and what your threshold is. So you can see, tune into directly to see, okay, this seems to be a, a good uh, threshold for my alert. So, so you see that you are in the right, right area. And then, then you can add uh, the action, of course. If this alert happens, please select me on this channel or send a ticket to this Jira uh, instance or email or, or SMS, for instance. And the next thing is uh, Logstash. There are some good features there as well. Uh, and one of the most notable are that you can now run multiple uh, pipelines in Logstash. You have one uh, JVM here, but you, you can run isolated uh, pipelines. So before you had, you know, you had to have a grok pattern and basically filter out different, uh, different pipelines. And if one 
for some reason got stuck, it would actually stop all the different uh, pipelines. So now we can run them in an isolated manner uh, side by side on the same log stash. So it's another great, great feature that we added on log stash. And you also have, uh, it's a log stash feature, but it's actually realized in Kibana, but you have something called the pipeline viewer. So you can see the, say the topology of what's happening on the log stash node uh, as graph, and that makes it easier to understand the topology of of, uh, of what's happening with your enrichment in uh, in log stash and your filters and grok patterns. Um, and you also see different metrics, what happens at every stage. Yeah, I can understand this text is now very small for you guys, but you can also see that with the color mark, and if you see something taking a lot of time, for instance, in the throughput, so you can directly say, identify bottlenecks uh, in different steps in your uh, in the log stash. Uh, <coughs> um, and as I said, yeah, you you might want to have several log stash depending on how much throughput you have. And before you had to basically configure every logstash instance with their own configuration files uh, locally on the different servers but now you can have a centralized management ui from the kibana so you can basically yes yeah, centralize configure the logstash instances uh, from there and the logstash will will check on a regular basis if there is new configurations that it should use uh, so it makes it easier from an operation point of view and make sure that everyone is using the the correct configurations And the last component is uh, is beats, um, and yeah, we have added uh, support for for Docker earlier, but now we're also adding uh, adding Kubernetes with the with the metric beats, so you get the information on CPU usage, memory usage, and so on. Uh, you get the, the the Docker metadata with the things like container ID and and yeah, image labels, etc as well as uh, Kubernetes metadata with information like pods and container names and so on. And yeah, you have a lot of new things happening and here we also see a lot of support from the, the open source community with a lot of people contributing to new metrics modules. So you have on Firebit, you have Redis and Isinga and yeah, on the on the metrics side, yeah, we get Kubernetes, like I mentioned, or RabbitMQ, for instance, uh, that is predefined. So it doesn't only help you with, say, the collection of the data, uh, but also what type of mapping, how the different data should be mapped in the most efficient way. And then also gives example on the dashboard in the Kibana that you can get a uh, nice visualization of this data. So it makes you easier from all the way from gestions to the to the visualization. So and that's almost spot on on, on 45 minutes. So uh, that was um, a very quick and uh, uh, go through of the different uh, as we see as reference architectures from from Beats all the way to to Kibana with different uh, ways to scale your cluster uh, and to use uh, use our different components.